are so many interesting stories about the films on the docket at this year's Myrtle Beach International Film Festival, and one of the most fascinating stories is about a movie that was 80 years in the making. That's right, it was filmed 80 years ago, and it is now making its debut. The producer of the film, at least the modern producer of the film, is here with us now, Ed Hartman. Tell us about As the Earth Turns. How did that come to be? Well, uh, kind of a th through a number of things. I'm a composer and based in Seattle, and I make music for film and television. I score movies. I also license movies and TV shows, things like that. And uh, I also teach percussion. And a mother of a student that I taught originally a few years back started to take lessons. She had come into the estate of her great uncle's film stock and uh, realized that I might be able to score one of these films that was found that had never been released. So uh, she, she, we, went, we actually created a production company to do it, and I spent about a month scoring it, um, and then we've been promoting it at festivals. This, it's taken a life on its own. I mean, I never thought it would be doing any of this stuff when I started this. Yeah. So I started as a composer, and now I'm co-producer. I did some editing on the film. Uh, I'm now promoting it. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> I appreciate it. Tell us about the filmmaker. How did he get involved in making this film as the Earth turns? And I'm working on a documentary about it, so I am becoming a filmmaker, whether I want to or not. Uh, he started off, he, he did a whole bunch of things. By, by the time he was 20, he had made nine films on 60 millimeter stock that he developed, edited himself. He had written 58 stage and screen plays wow. before, he did, before he went pro or anything like that. This was the last of those films. We're discovering a few more. We hope to find more. And uh, it, originally it was a little longer. We were able to put together what we think is a pretty good cut. Uh, I did find some uh, footage that I was able to edit in as well. Uh, he had a company of 50 to 100 people to help uh, in his house in Seattle. He had a theater in his basement with 50 seats that they would sell for a nickel uh, and help fund their projects. He also was a great photographer and paid for these projects. Eventually, he went on to Hollywood. He was hired by Disney, partially because of the experiments he did with sound. This is a silent movie that we did, but he was playing around with dual record players synchronized to 60 millimeter projectors. Wow. He was a technician as well. And Disney became very interested in that, wound up hiring him. He worked on Dumbo, it's back, yes. uh, as well as Fantasia and Pinocchio. And then he went in the army, uh, and then he came back uh, and uh, did his, uh, some more films. One of the biggest things he did is he directed and edited a, an Academy Award winning film, The Titan, about Michelangelo with Robert Snyder, wow. who had done amazing amounts of documentaries beforehand. So uh, he's really kind of a somewhat of an unknown. He went behind the scenes and became more technical at it. He also came back to Disney and wound up working on some of the animal documentaries on Disney in the 50s and 60s. Some were extraordinarily popular. This man's name was? Richard Lyford. Okay, so we can look him up on IMDb and see all of his credits or most of his credits you there. You will find some things. We're piecing them together as we speak. Yeah. Uh, we discovered him, I should say my, my co-producer Kim, discovered him through one of the classic horror film boards. There seems to be somewhat of a cult following for his films there, and they found her. Okay. And then she wound up working with his son uh, to, to deal with the film stock, and we've been digitizing uh, the, all these things as we can. As the Earth Turns, what is it about? Is it a fiction film? Is it a documentary? What is it? It's a, it's a, it was in 1938. It was a science fiction film. Uh, he'd done a lot of horror and things like that. This film uh, is amazing. I, I mean, it has really good solid acting in it. It has special effects. He was blowing up dynamite. He, he made tremendous models. That was another reason why Disney became very interested in him. He, in fact, for Disney, he designed the Dumb Bomber which became kind of a World War II thing. Uh, but in, you'll see a lot of his models in this film uh, that were used. Uh, it somewhat foreshadows uh, things to come. There's dialogue that seems to be straight out of Austin Powers, uh, <laughs> Star Trek, any, any number of films, you, you know, Casino Royale. I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff out there. Uh, but it's really well made and edited. Uh, this is a fairly traditional cut 
we're probably going to release something eventually that's cleaner. But we really, when we started this, we wanted to keep it as authentic as possible. Right. Because I think the point is, you can watch this movie and go, well, gee, it's, a, it's an old silent film. But if you look at the, the creativity behind it, the intelligence and script, and, and see how he, he was able to execute the effects and things like that, considering the era, because this was about Flash Gordon serial era, right. and he has flying things that are on par with that. Uh, you know, I, I think it's pretty credible for what he did. And I, I think there's a lot of directors that could learn something for it. And this was all done on 60 millimeter film. No cameras, no iPhones. Hmm. He had to develop all the footage himself. Wow. There's a surprise last scene in it that might be a little interesting for, for filmmakers. It's shot in black and white. But there's something that happens in the end that's quite unique as well. What was the quality of the film when you got to it? I mean, was it damaged? Was it good enough quality that you could make something out of it? It was in pretty good shape. I mean, I, the cut that I received from my co-producer originally, I didn't have any problem with it. Again, the edits are a little, uh, you know, rough, and, and we can cut those out eventually. But again, we wanted to make sure that filmmakers see the challenges of that era. Mm -hmm. He really became Noah's quite, quite the editor, and I, I think that you can see that in this film. Also. Uh, he was born in 1917, two years after Orson Welles. He died in the same year in 1985. Mm. Had he have not kind of disappeared into Hollywood doing technical work and especially been drafted, I'm not sure he, we would be talking about him, we might be talking about him like Orson Welles, because I think he would have developed a whole other level of, of filmmaking at that point. Uh, and and uh, there's a lot of people that agree with me on that. So this was... Uh a, a somewhat undeveloped talent that's now being discovered 80 years later when he was in his really nascent stage, uh, really early stage of his career. Yeah, th yeah, this, I mean, this was his Citizen Kane. Yeah. And it was not done in a studio. This was done in Seattle, Washington with his own gear. Yeah. There's no studios anywhere. He, he did everything himself, and, but he had a good team to put together to do that. So this gives you an idea of kind of what a young filmmaker would have looked like at that time and place there. And it should be inspiration, I would think, to filmmakers today, even though this was shot 80 years ago, it shows what you can do with a limited budget, with a limited crew, you can still make some really great art. That's true, and he had zero budget, he had yeah. nothing. He had to come up with money, again, my, he, he did pictures for magazines and things like that, and paid for all the stock. Uh, and, and the cameras he got, you know, some were secondhand. Yeah. Uh, but he, he, was, he was remarkable for what he did. Now the music that I chose to create, well, that I wrote, was kind of in a classical uh, romantic theme. I didn't find out until after I had scored this, uh, this type of music that he would have played with discs on it. We actually have discovered the disc. We might be able to listen to them in the future. Good. He was also doing sound effects in the background while he did this too. So it's an interesting score. It's pretty dramatic. I think it's good era oriented as well, so it fits well with the film. The film is called As the Earth Turns. It is now making its debut 80 years after it was filmed. It's amazing. That's right, it's yeah. It's a remarkable we're story. Right at the moment, we're in 68 festivals, it's won 73 awards. I've gotten 20 best scores. That's terrific. Which is wonderful for me. And I'm looking for filmmakers to score films for. That's why I'm here. Very good. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Ed Hartman. Thank, Thank you. you.